Long ago, before this day's confusion did begin Throughout the stars did we go wandering Distance was no barrier And time it had no hope Free to come and free to go Free to come and free to go Open up the book Hello, everyone, and welcome to Karmic Evolution's Astrologically Speaking podcast. I'm your host, Sherry Horn Hassan of Karmic Evolution Astrology, and I'm coming to you on November 24th, 2023, from karmicevolution.com or any of your favorite podcast stations. Just a quick reminder that this show aims to bring you the truth about astrology and your soul's karmic evolution. Uh, first, uh, my usual housekeeping stuff, which is just to tell you that a new podcast drops every Friday at 11 a.m. Pacific and 2 p.m. Eastern. And if you go to karmicevolution.com and click on the upper right-hand portion of the banner podcast, you can scroll down the page, hear the podcast either live or after the fact, the recording, and you can search archived recordings there for any podcast that you may have missed or which you would like to listen again. Also on that page is the downloadable freebie called How to Keep Your Sun Sign Happy, which includes friendly astrological advice for every sun sign from renowned evolutionary astrologer Stephen Forrest about what each of us, depending on our sun sign, truly needs to be happy. So be sure to grab it when you listen to this podcast, whether you do so live or after the fact, and enjoy some astrological words of wisdom. Separately, you can always follow me on my Facebook page at Karmic Evolution for Your Soul and on Instagram on karmic.evolution. And if you would like to learn more about the true meaning of your individual birth chart in order to gain greater consciousness about your soul's true mission and purpose in this lifetime, I am offering to podcast listeners only a 75-minute Karmic Evolution Natal Insight reading for only $125. So if you'd like to move from chaos to clarity about why you're here, what is your purpose and soul mission in this lifetime, and what might be holding you back from achieving your highest destiny in this lifetime, this reading can reveal how the energies into which you chose to be born may be holding you back now by keeping you stuck in old, habitual, past, or early life patterns. <clears throat> Excuse me. Understanding such conditioned soul behavior can assist you to make different, more positive choices moving forward especially in the areas that are of greatest interest to you in particular. Could be your relationships, could be your job and your career, could be your finances, or possibly your health. So if you'd like to co-create your own future happiness through astrological insight, this is the reading for you. Conscious awareness has never been so easy or so affordable when you take advantage of my special discounted offer at karmicevolution.com slash karmic125. And finally, before we launch into this week's astro news you can use, I want to tell everyone that I am giving a lecture for the North Jersey NCGR Astrology Group titled Discover Your Inner Intuitive, Learn How to Locate and Enhance Your Psychic Gifts and Aptitudes in Your Astrology Birth Chart with moi. <laughs> um, and, you know, the promo for this is just um, to say that we're all intuitive, at least to a certain degree, but often we need validation to actually trust our intuition. So validating 
first and then expanding our into our individual intuitive capabilities can help enhance our creativity can aid us in making decisions that we know intuitively are right for us and it can increase our potential for future happiness so in this talk i'm going to explore how to decipher <clears throat> precisely what grants uh, per any particular individual his or her intuitive and or psychic capabilities as defined by planets, signs, house locations, and aspects that pinpoint the specific nature of such aptitudes. I'm also going to look at what might be blocking our natural intuitive capabilities in the form of astrological placements, you know, say to Saturn or Pluto or one of the outer planets that can cause doubt. And that in turn can cause many of us, especially if we're raised this way, which most of us are, at least my experience in the Western world and in America, the, the reaction to that can range from an over-reliance on only logical, rational thinking, um, all the way to actually experiencing fear, which a lot of us do um, because of religious indoctrination or other things that we were told, taught, or forced to believe when we were young, that made it wrong for us to trust our intuitive or psychic messages or what I will call capability. So if you're interested in joining me for this enlightening discussion, it's going to take place on Sunday, December 3rd from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. And you can simply go to the North Jersey NCGR page on Facebook and click the link to sign up. The fee for the webinar is $15, um, and if you do sign up, bring your birth chart along and be prepared to learn some interesting stuff about what helps you rely not only on your logical and rational mind, but on your intuition as well. And I do have a link in the shortest link I could possibly get if you want to take this down from this recording, is the website at um, it's https colon backslash backslash right that's the number www bit dot ly slash backslash inner hyphen intuitive so it's bitly but bit dot ly backslash inner hyphen intuitive or as I said if you're on Facebook just go to uh, North Jersey NCGR page, and you can sign up there. Anyway, I look forward to seeing you there for a really interesting um, webinar, which I've been wanting to give for quite some time. Uh, that's because I believe that our intuition, once we can access it, not only access it re and receive it, but trust it, is so important for all of us. Okay, so now let's get to this week's astro news you can use. So first, let's do our usual review. We know that last week the Sun and Mars came together at 25 degrees and 38 minutes of Scorpio on November 17th. And that was the date of last week's podcast, which I had to record the day before. Today, because of the Thanksgiving holiday, I'm actually recording Friday morning, so my news part should be a little more up to date, which I'm actually thankful for because I like that. But anyway, the Sun-Mars conjunction began a new synodic cycle of Mars revolution around the Sun, which will last for the next 2.2 years, roughly two years and two months. I referred to astrologer Robert Wilkinson's remarks last week about this conjunction, which included his saying that, or predicting that, quote, powerful events can happen. Well, happen they did. And I'll remind everyone now that he also noted, and here I'm quoting, because the Sun and Mars provide power to move things forward at a brisk pace, be a little cautious in your use of power these next few weeks. He noted that as the Sun represents vitality and illumination, and Mars represents energy and blunt force, find a measure of self-restraint as you consider other angles of approach with an eye to efficient adaptation and being at home in any circumstance. So we saw a number of newsworthy events happen around the world between November 17th at this conjunction and now, including the Sun and Mars entrance into Sagittarius 
on November 22nd and yesterday on the 24th, respectively. So today, they remain within two degrees of each other, although the Sun, the faster-moving planet, is beginning to separate from Mars. Um, I realize I want to mention, too, that yesterday there was this, um, sh you know, shock and delay and whatever, but uh, not delay. I mean, it, I'm thinking that the trains were delayed in New York because up in on the Rainbow Bridge in uh, Niagara, at the customs border between the United States and Canada, as many of us heard on the news, a car um, going over 100 miles an hour hit the edge of the, well, hit something and then flew up in the air and then came down against the corner of the customs building there and exploded into flames. So, um, again, there was an explosion on the Rainbow Bridge, which was the bridge that connects Canada to the U.S. at, at Niagara Falls, as I said. The, the incident happened shortly before 12.15. Um, I think it was around noon. I don't have an exact time, Eastern time. But um, they know that, again, the car was going 100 miles an hour, Mars, right, entering in, into Sagittarius, Sun in Sag, Mars entering, um, and that the two occupants died. They now know that it was a Bentley that had two, uh, a couple, a uh, married couple in their 50s, who lived not far on the New York side away from Niagara. They never found any bombs or explosions in the car. They had ruled out almost within just a few hours after the incident that it was not a terrorist incident. But, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's interesting. It's sad and it's, and it's horrible. But um, what I noticed is that, you know, the sun entered fiery Sagittarius on the 22nd and, hold on, is it 20? Yeah, and then, um, and then squared Saturn. So I said when, when the sun entered Sagittarius, the Pisces moon uh, and Neptune in the third house was in the third house. This is, uh, you know, uh, mundane astrology. And I, I had written on Facebook somewhere that the Pisces moon conjunct Neptune in the third house, where are we going again? With the moon partile trine Mars and Scorpio, I don't know, but we got to move fast, maybe even faster than we really want to, because it's a trine. So easy, fast-moving, watery trine as the Sag Sun Pisces Saturn square halts it suddenly as this car slams into an obstacle, and Mars waxing towards entering Sagittarius only, uh, you know, a day, less than a day later, I mean, this was at noon, and the uh, Mars entered Sag at 4.27 a.m. Eastern Time today, that set the whole thing ablaze. And again, the whole thing was tragic, but I didn't want to neglect mentioning it, because it seems such a, hmm, I hate to put it this way, but perfect example of how this energy manifested in a particular place. I also note the symbolism, because you guys know I'm big on that. This is the Rainbow Bridge, right? And I look at the symbolism of, you know, um, what's going on now in the world, especially the word rainbow as it relates to LGBTQ um, rights and the rights of others, um, and that this can be somewhat of a harbinger, something might blow up. I'm also going to talk in a few minutes about the Israel-Hamas um, hostage release deal, which did go into effect this morning and is currently ongoing, and whether or not the release of the first 13 of the negotiated 50 hostages is actually going to possibly, there was already a delay, which I'll talk about, but that it was, it's maybe too high in the sky, you know, rainbow, what's at the end of the rainbow, the pot of gold, is that a little too high in the sky, because we're all looking for that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and maybe we won't find it, so, you know, it depends on, uh, the point of that is not that we won't, but it is that how much are we hoping against hope without, you know, thinking about the, the, the details is a very Sagittarian uh, kind of energy in thinking about that, right? 
because you're you're traveling, you're adventurous, you're looking for the end of the rainbow because there's a reward at the end of the rainbow. Well, is it what you really imagined it to be or is it something perhaps less than that? So again, looking back, what else happened between November 17th at the Sun-Mars conjunction in Scorpio and now? And I'd mentioned last week Donald Trump's fascist speech, you know, recent fascist fascist fascistic speech um, as this conjunction was waxing. But now I want to mention the confrontations that took place in Congress. Most of us who keep track of the news and are interested in politics already know this, but it's just, um, you know, I don't want to be remiss in pointing out that it happened at this particular astrological time. So, um, you know, these confrontations that took place both during House and Senate hearings in the U.S. Capitol and in the hallways of the Capitol building um, it really illustrated the kind of lack of self-restraint about which Robert Wilkinson was writing, you know, that I quoted. So the, these two, like I said, these two incidents in the House and the Senate got major press attention. So I'm not going to go into more detail than to note that the first one was when Oklahoma Senator Mark Wayne Mullins, who, by the way, has a degree in applied science in construction technology from Oklahoma State University, challenged Sean O'Brien, the president of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, to, quote, stand your butt up and settle longstanding differences right there in the room, according to the Associated Press. And at that point, Senator Bernie Sanders proved to be the only adult in the room when he admonished Mullins to sit down and remember that he is a United States senator, and um, I would add, for Christ's sakes. And then there's former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, who shoved GOP Tennessee Rep Tim Burchett in the hallway of the Capitol building, uh, and Burchett, which you may or may not know, is one of the members who voted to oust McCarthy from his speaker position. And for his part, McCarthy denied that he did anything at all, despite the fact that a reporter was there to bear witness to the fact that he did shove the uh, Burchett. So it makes you think, no wonder Congress can't pass a permanent budget, right? Um and when I spoke last week about the relevance of the word hostage everywhere on hostage taking, I neglected to mention that the biggest example of this really here in America is how Americans have been held hostage by the elected officials they put into power who are apparently more interested in infighting, at least on the GOP side, than helping the American people who elected them in any substantial way, shape, or form. And then there's Elon Musk, the world's richest man, who endorsed on November 15th, as we wax toward the November 17th Sun-Mars conjunction in Scorp, a post on X, according to that, according to Spectrum News, quote, espoused baseless anti-Semitic conspiracy theories that Jewish people are promoting hatred against whites and support bringing hordes of minorities into Western nations, drawing and that that his, that uh, that post drew condemnation from Jewish groups and praise from white nationalists and anti-Semites. And Musk wrote in response, you have said the actual truth. And on November 18th, Musk's SpaceX company launched a second rocket into space from Texas, which according to CNBC, quote, flew for more than seven minutes successfully separating from its booster before the rocket's onboard system intentionally destroyed the vehicle mid-flight. The intentional destruction of Starship represents a premature end to the flight test as SpaceX planned to fly it most of the way around the Earth before re-entering the atmosphere and splashing down off the coast of Kauai, Hawaii. Anyone see the symbolism that I just mentioned of the uh, concerning the Sun-Mars conjunction and blowing things up. The ensuing outcry against Musk's endorsement of anti-Semitism tropes on the Twitter X platform uh, was led by the watchdog group Media Matters, which claimed that X places mainstream advertisements next to Nazi propaganda on his site, 
which prompted Musk to file a lawsuit against Media Matters just after the first quarter lunar square of the Aquarius moon to the Scorpio sun, which occurred on November 20th. Um, He'd threatened to file it the day before on the 20th, but it took him until the 21st. Um, So anyway, it's interesting now to note that while previously we had no confirmed birth time for Musk, recently Astro Data Bank has given him his chart a B rating uh, for a 7.30 a.m. birth time for his June 28, 1971 birth in Pretoria, South Africa. And this means the birth time is based on biographical information that the site considers reliable. So we may use it, but we can always take it with a grain of salt, as they say. But looking at this chart, I'd attribute Musk's pugilistic stance to the fact that the Sun-Mars conjunction fell right on his 25-degree 27 uh, Scorpio fifth house cusp, and that both the Sun and Mars then moved on to exact conjoin his natal fifth house Jupiter at 27 degrees and 38 minutes of Scorpio on November 20th, again at the first quarter waxing lunar square, when the Aquarius moon squared the Scorpio sun from his eighth house of joint resources and deep bonded trust to his fifth house of children, creativity, romance, and risk-taking, among other things. So also of note is that at this 7.30 a.m. birth time, Musk has a cancer rising, and that, that Jupiter's location, as noted, is in his fifth house of children. So the fact that Elon Musk, I mean, would say Jupiter's expansion in the house of children, the fact that Elon Musk is the father of 11 children with three different women might lend credence to this being a valid chart. And as an aside, the mother of three of the tech entrepreneur's children, who is the artist who goes by the name Grimes, recently filed a petition in court to establish parental rights after her split with Musk. And since Mars entered Sagittarius early today, November 24th, it will exact conjoin his natal fifth house, zero degree, 48 minute Sagittarius Neptune, which conjoins his Jupiter out of sign, and trigger his T-square of Neptune opposite to his 11th house, one degree, seven minute Gemini Saturn and square to his second house, eight degree, 14 minute Virgo moon. So Mars will exact conjoin the, um, his Neptune and oppose his Saturn on, um, November 25th and 26th respectively, and will exact square his moon on December 5th. So in other words, Mars and the the sun first and then the, then Mars They're triggering this T-square in his chart. So watch for how he acts out his frustration in public even more between now and then. And um, additional fallout from the Sun-Mars conjunction at 25 degrees and 38 minutes of Scorpio was exhibited during the international leg of pop singer Taylor Swift's concert tour as it kicked off in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil on November 17th, where, according to the Associated Press, quote, before the show Friday, fans lined up for hours outside the Nilton Santos Olympic Stadium, where temperatures soared to 105 degrees Fahrenheit with a heat index of nearly 138 degrees Fahrenheit. Swift, alarmed during the concert by audience members crying out for help and for water due to the heat wave, stopped the show to request help from concert staff to deliver water bottles to those in the audience who needed them. Swift later canceled the following night's concert after it was discovered that a 23-year-old woman had collapsed and died later that night. Of note, well, she collapsed at the concert and taken to the hospital and died later. Of note is the fact that Swift, born December 13, 1989, at 5.17 a.m. in Reading, Pennsylvania, has a 25-degree, 34-minute Scorpio ascendant, and Mars is in her first house at 26 degrees, 41 Scorpio, and both took the direct hit from the Sun-Mars conjunction the day of her concert. She's also a first house Sagittarius sun and an eighth house Cancer moon Jupiter. 
making her both adventurous and extremely emotionally sensitive. We talked about her chart in my uh, ongoing aspects class, so, um, you know, that we got more into depth about that. But after the sudden tragic death of the young woman at her first night's concert, Swift issued a heartfelt statement on Instagram in which she said that the young woman's death left her with a shattered heart. And then there's the chaos that occurred in the uh, artificial intelligence biz industry when Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, was unexpectedly fired from his job by his board of directors on November 17th, also the Sun-Mars Conjunction Day. Altman was born April 22nd, 1985 in Chicago, Illinois, but we have no known birth time. But regardless, we can see that he's got a 27 degree, 27 minute natal Mars and Taurus <clears throat> opposite his 26 degree, 28 minute natal Saturn in Scorpio. So the Scorpio Sun Mars conjunction triggered this opposition by falling on his Saturn, which by nature is quite a frustrating energy. So it's clear to see how this became a crisis for him related to those who wanted to restrict his power by firing him. However, by November 21st, as Mars sextiled Pluto, which is an aspect of an opportunity for greater self-empowerment, and after 700 of OpenAI's something like 780 employees threatened to leave the company with Altman, who was immediately hired by Microsoft, quote, OpenAI reinstated Sam Altman as its chief executive in a stunning reversal that capped five days of drama that rocked the artificial intelligence company, a, a community, according to NPR News. Quote, the company maker of the popular chat GPT said it would also create a new board of directors. This comes after the former board voted to fire Altman as CEO late last week. Now, I believe this is important to mention because it's an important harbinger of Pluto's current transit through Capricorn and its pending re-entrance and it's, you know, doing this dance for the past uh, year of having gone into Aquarius and then back into Capricorn. Now it's direct in Capricorn and headed for re-enter Aquarius on January 20th, 2024. It will retrograde one more time briefly into Capricorn before it goes into um, Aquarius for the long term. I think it's uh, November 19th of 2024. But, you know, the reason it's so important, I think, is because a lot of the dispute around Altman's firing was centered on disagreements with various board members about whether the company's mission is to accelerate AI use or to slow it based on safety concerns. And this becomes more interesting when we realize that Pluto, as it goes back into Capricorn, is about sort of the death knell to, to capitalism, but that Pluto in Aquarius is theoretically at least about transforming through technology. So the former's less altruistically inclined, that's Pluto and Cap, it's more, it's more uh, profit inclined, right? While the latter can play out either way, by either by being more humanitarian minded in terms of the benefits of technology or by placing people of different in ideologies about whether AI must be used cautiously um, versus charging ahead because it's just new technology and you want to be the first ones to be out there with it. And it'll divide these two ideological um, uh, groups into opposing groups. Um, and this, which is from the New York Times deal book newsletter, helps explain what I mean. And I quote, one big question, who watches the watchers? The drama has revealed just how uncertain oversight of this hugely consequential technology is. Open AI has an unusual extra, uh, structure, and they're talking about the company, in which a nonprofit entity controls the for-profit organization that produced chat GPT which most of us have heard of. Observers, including the tech executive Marissa Mayer and the investor Dan Loeb, highlighted this setup as a big problem. It gives a nonprofit board with little financial stake in the company and little experience in corporate governance power over commercial investors. And it goes on to say how much of the future of open AI technology is going to be hamstrung 
because they made the mistake in the first place of placing that IP and that tech within the public charity in the first place. Oh, that's redundant. And I'm quoting, boo, I, that they need an editor. Anyway, uh, this is according to Scott Sifax, a corporate governance expert who also ran a nonprofit that created a for-profit business. And his quote is, you know, as told to Dealbook. Um, so this, this whole issue is, you know, going to be dealt with, I think, now <clears throat> as Pluto retrogrades back and forth until he goes into Aquarius for the next 20 years in late November of 2024. But back to the news, because I still think there's so much and there's stuff that I have to leave out because I just can't get to it because I want to get to the Gemini full moon for you guys, too. But I think I, I would feel remiss if I didn't mention this stuff because it's so indicative of what's you know happened in the past week. Um, since the November 13th Scorpio new moon, the sun moon can you know, the sun Mars conjunction in Scorpio and the first quarter lunar square leading up to the Gemini moon. So there's also the death of former President Jimmy Carter's wife, former First Lady Rosalind Carter, who uh, passed away at the age of 96 on November 19th. So just days after that uh, conjunction. Um, so looking at her natal chart, it's clear that she took the Sun-Mars conjunction in Scorpio square to her 12th house, 24 degree, 32 minute Leo Sun, which is conjunct her 26 degree, 37 minute Neptune conjunction. So basically that 25 Scorp fell right in between those two of her conjunction. While transiting Neptune was exact opposite her first house natal Venus and quincunx to her natal 12th house sun. So I have to say that this of course made me reminisce the whole story thinking about it was that my very first vote was at the age of 18 for Jimmy Carter and, you know, a freshman in college or whatever. Um, and upon looking at Rosalind's chart and seeing her five degree Virgo rising and her three degree Gemini midheaven and her seven degree Taurus moon, which trined her Mercury ruled ascendant from the ninth house of publishing, I thought, hmm, I wonder if she was a writer. And only after her passing, when I read, you know, a lot of her bio, did I realize that she'd written 27 books during her lifetime and that she's been quoted, um, you know, it's been on the news, uh, video quotes or whatever, you know, clips. She was quoted as having said how much she truly loved politics, which is also a ninth house, you know, topic. So I thought, wow. Um, in any case, the um, November 20th first quarter lunar phase of the Scorpio new moon monthly cycle, again, heavily flavored by the Sun-Mars conjunction, there was um, this reported in the New York Times on November 20th. Federal court moves to drastically weaken Voting Rights Act. The article goes on, the ruling, which is almost certain to be appealed to the Supreme Court, would effectively bar private citizens and civil rights groups from suing under a key provision of the landmark law. The ruling made by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit found that only the federal government could bring a legal challenge under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, a crucial part of the law that prohibits election or voting practices that discriminate against Americans based on race. This is, of course, the further weakening of the Voter Voting Rights Act in the Constitution, um, you know, American Constitution that started um, long before, but um, is it Shelby, Shelby versus, uh, um, oh God, I've forgotten, something county, that uh, several years ago, um, Chief Justice John Roberts is known to be anti-voting rights. So, um, you know, there's plenty to research here for those who are not familiar with this issue, and, you know, that's not going to take too long. But in any case, meanwhile, on November 19th, Argentina elected a far-right libertarian as president, and again, according to the New York Times, quote, Javier Millet, Millet, I think, an economist and former television personality who has drawn comparisons to Donald Trump, won a decisive victory on November 19th, Millet has vowed to take a chainsaw, Sun, Mars, and Scorpio, anyone, to the state 
by slashing public spending and to replace the peso with the dollar in a bid to cut inflation. As an aside, I noticed, I don't know if it was this morning or yesterday, <clears throat> that Donald Trump called him to congratulate him on his winning the election. And this also from the New York Times on November 23rd. Long a bastion of liberalism, the Netherlands takes a sharp right turn. And the article, uh, the first paragraph, the first sentence says, in an election result that sent shock waves across Europe, Geert Wilders, a longtime far-right provocateur, is closer than ever to becoming prime minister. And on that same day, the New York Times also reported that Finland steps up border closings in dispute with Russia. This has been going on for weeks now, but it, the paper says the escalation comes as Finland tries to address a rise in the arrivals of migrants and asylum seekers that officials blame on Moscow. Moscow is letting immigrants pass through and go on to Finland, a NATO country. Um, and um, let's not forget about Mercury and Sagittarius right now. So meanwhile, there's this from Reuters this week out of Karachi, Pakistan, on November 21st. Quote, the UN Refugee Agency on Tuesday expressed concern over widespread distress in large Afghan refugee communities across Pakistan, where authorities are conducting searches to round up and expel undocumented foreigners. Islamabad, which is the capital of Pakistan, last month announced it would expel over a million undocumented refugees, mostly Afghans, amid a row, row, as the British say, with Kabul, over charges it harbors anti-Pakistan militants. It's a little bit equivalent to Egypt not wanting to open up its southern border to Gazans because they fear letting in too many militants. But the article goes on, over 370,000 Afghans have fled Pakistan since October 1st. And again, Mercury is still in Sagittarius. Okay, so now as we turn to the Israel-Hamas war in Gaza, let's note that a hostage release deal was announced November 22nd as the sun entered Sagittarius and Venus opposed wounded healer Chiron. A ceasefire did go into effect earlier this morning, that's today on November 24th, um, that allows for a pause in the bombing, um, uh, you know, the Israeli bombing, but also on the other side, the gathering of the first 13 out of a total of 50 hostages agreed to be released by Hamas, and the allowance into Gaza of 200 trucks, I think they said a day, with humanitarian aid, including fuel to help run the Gazan hospitals. Um, and it was at the first quarter lunar square that 28 premature babies arrived in Egypt from Gaza to receive care in two hospitals, an Egyptian government source told Reuters, after the infants, this was, I think, October, uh, November 20th or 21st, after the infants were evacuated from Al-Shifa Hospital in northern Gaza. And as the sun entered Sagittarius again on November 22nd, that hostage deal agreement was reached. So yesterday's sun Saturn square delayed this release until early this morning when Mars entered Sagittarius, and it still remains to be seen what frustrations may occur between now and tomorrow at the Mars-Saturn square. Regular listeners may recall I mentioned the possibility of a delay in this hostage deal during last week's podcast. So this leads me to the upcoming Gemini new moon, which will arrive at excuse me, 26 degrees 11 minutes of the chatty sign of curiosity, communication, and siblings, uh, twins, or pairs of any kind, so read duality, the concept of duality, at 9.37 p.m. Pacific on June, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, um, oop, hold on, that's not right, hold on. Okay, so the point I'm trying to make, now that I've cleared my mind here, um, is that I wanted to note, as I um, did recently with another another uh, lunation, set of lunations, is that the Gemini new moon, which occurred on um, June 18th um, of this year, that's the one that was at 26 degrees and 11 minutes of Gemini. 
and that that represent Gemini obviously represents the things I just I just said right um, and that the culmination of this Gemini new moon is at the next week's Gemini full moon so the point I'm trying to make is that the theme of brothers what I had written back in um, uh, last June is the headline I had used was Gemini new moon squares Neptune as Saturn stations retrograde in Pisces June 17th betrayal of our values leads to a readjustment in partnership and given that the theme of brothers is so resoundingly evident in the Middle East current conflict raging between Israel and Hamas in the Gaza Strip right now that you know uh, we were asked six months ago roughly to plant seeds that could blossom into a healthy sense of curiosity about which partnerships are most likely to nurture and sustain us over the long term and which are not and so we you know we're looking at that time about reevaluating specific relationships in which we may have misplaced our faith in the past and if that was so upon that realization how we could plant seeds that would evolve into the recovery of our sense of trust in the true long-term value of any particular relationship but I again I find it somewhat um, astonishingly uh, symbolic that Gemini is the symbol of brotherhood right and that the Jews and the Arabs as and the, 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 well, let's say the Israelis and the Arabs and the Jews and the Muslims are brothers and sisters under the skin. So um, at that time, at that June 17th Gemini new moon, the sun and the moon both conjoined with the asteroid goddess Juno in Gemini. And it also, as noted, formed a mutable cross that by they all squared Neptune, the planet of illusion, confusion, and delusion in Pisces because they're, they opposed the dwarf planet Ceres. Now, Juno, which I've spoken about before, is the goddess asteroid of the archetype of the wife or the partner of Jupiter, the king of the gods, in Roman mythology, and Hera, the wife of Zeus in Greek mythology. And Ceres, of course, is the goddess of the grain and the harvest who enables fertilization of the crops. So it represents literal food that sustains our bodies and therefore our life. I also see it as sustenance in terms of faith. So taken in the context of this upcoming Gemini full moon, and given all that's transpired since then, not the least of which was the fact that the presence of Juno as the partner is being echoed now in terms of the questions, who's my brother and who is my sister? And that of series related then to issues around grain. Of course, we can talk about Ukraine and the worries that the Russian war against Ukraine impeded the shipment of Ukraine's wheat crops to the outer world. Remember, Ukraine's known as the breadbasket of the world. And even though the United States receives only roughly 14% of its grain from there, Ukraine is a major supplier to third world countries, including many in Africa. Africa. And I thought it's interesting to note that biblically grain is known as the staff of life and represents as well manna from heaven. So as we approach the Gemini full moon on November 27th, that falls at 4 degrees and 51 minutes, of the Gemini Sagittarius polarity and occurs at 1.16 a.m. Pacific time and 4.16 a.m. Eastern time. I'm mindful now how this is part of the monthly lunar cycle since the November 13th Scorpio new moon, which was opposed by Uranus retrograde in Taurus and which trine Neptune in Pisces, how we've seen so much revealed about the Scorpionic nature. So with this Gemini full moon, it's the emotional security-oriented moon that reflects the Sagittarius sun's light back onto itself, revealing its shadow side. And it's when our bellies are full and we're content in partnership that we may move then onto higher philosophical ground and contemplate, or I should say have the luxury of contemplating the true meaning of life. 
So in addition to partnership representing a strong theme at this lunation, its secondary message revolves around, you know, um, sustainable relationships. So now as the inquisitive, social, curious, and loquacious Gemini moon opposes the Sagittarius sun, and Sagittarius can be very righteous. Sagittarius usually adopts a righteous cause. Um, and, and uh, you know, the moon is also um, going to be close to Mars in Sagittarius now. We can see how the mothering instinct might be to try to calm this warlike energy that's righteously been ramped up to fight for a cause, all right? So Sagittarius Sun, let's let's go, let's do it, let's 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 do the Crusades. Yeah, why? Because we believe in, uh, in we righteously believe in our religion, so we're going to teach those you know infidels a lesson, right? Um, and how the Gemini Moon can talk to the Sagittarius Sun by by noting the concept that. Attitudes and opinions are actually formed by perceptions, and perceptions, you know, form our perspective about life. So in other words, those things are what lend themselves to the philosophy of life that we all develop, which is the Sagittarian nature. So if you have one perspective and you see things one way, but I have a completely different perspective based on my own set of experiences, then there's the recipe for the Sun-Mars conjunction in Scorpio to have armored itself even more against the other. So if I see you as evil and you see me as evil, meaning we both see ourselves as good, we can see the dual nature inherent in the Geminian archetype, right? And remember that our perspective is based also, again, on our experiences. So as the Gemini archetype goes out into the world asking questions and getting answers, it experiences different ones depending on where one is. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere, for example, and you ask if it's winter or summer, you'll be told it's winter based on your local geography. And that is what you will experience. It will get cold. It might snow. It gives, you know, there's more precipitation. You have to put on more layers to keep warm. You have to turn your heat on. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, at the same time, the answer to that question will be completely the opposite because summer there is when it's winter up north. So I, I hope you grasp what I'm saying here. So one's perspective, often based on one's Geminian concept of the near neighborhood or the local landscape or geography, lends itself to the development of attitudes and opinions, which necessarily, which necessarily rely on local facts, or shall I say local truths, but not necessarily universal ones. You know, I say tomato, you say tomato would be a silly superficial way to put it, but it works nonetheless, at least in reducing this to a basic conflict. So right now with Mercury and Sagittarius for the long haul, at least off and on, I come from, uh, a, you know, a, a, a local area that has this accent. You come from a different local area that has that accent. Which one is the right way to say it or to speak? Well, our differences in the way we see things may well expand now. So back to Israel, Hamas, and Gaza. This portion of the Middle East represents biblical areas, which I've already pointed out in terms of the biblical references to um, good versus to the duality of good versus ego, evil. But it's easy to use the biblical reference to Cain and Abel as a good example of Geminian archetypal energy of duality as it represents good versus evil. So the Sagittarius Sun-Mars, you know, conjunction had us cling to a religious, I'm sorry, a righteous belief that, well, the righteous belief in the Middle East that both sides must fight to protect or achieve this cause. You can fill in the blanks here yourself, you know, based on your own political, religious, and moral philosophies. But understand, please, that the point of this Gemini full moon is to release, release such righteousness. And how do we do that? By listening, says the Gemini moon, by being openly curious and really hearing the answers to questions without bias. Now, there's also, at this Gemini full moon a waxing square 
between Hygieia, the goddess of health, and Uranus retrograde in Taurus, which, you know, has all along since 2018 been asking us to change our values and during the retrograde period asked us to review our old values to confirm whether or not they're outdated so that they can be changed or, you know, changed up for newer, more relevant to the times values. So this Hygieia square Uranus will perfect on November 30th after the sun quincunxes Jupiter and um, Venus quincunxes Neptune. So my fear is that we may be moving towards some kind of major health crisis. The world is already witnessing one in Gaza because Hygieia, again, that, you know, is, is waxing into the square, which perfects on November 30th. So one of the greatest worries right now is the spread of disease in Gaza because of the lack of availability of water, medicine, and other badly needed hospital resources such as the aforementioned fuel. Now I've already seen articles about shortages of drugs, not the least of which is caused at least minimally if not majorly by the situation in Israel and Gaza, when Israel called up its 360,000 military reservists, this took people out of their normal daily jobs. And Israelis, Israel's Teva Neuroscience Company is on the world's largest, is one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies. According to Wikipedia, quote, Teva Pharmaceuticals Industry Limited, also known as Teva Pharmaceuticals, is an Israeli multinational pharmaceutical company with headquarters in Tel Aviv, Israel. And Teva is proud to be the second largest global supplier of medicines on the World Health Organization's, that's the WHO, essential medicines list for respiratory conditions. I cannot imagine how this Hygieia square Uranus is not going to factor into um, not just respiratory conditions, but all kinds of other conditions, probably treating infections and such like that. You know, the, these horrible stories out of Gaza of Palestinians wounded by Israeli strikes who've had to have limbs amputated with no um, um, painkillers, no morphine, no, no you know... Um, uh, other drugs available, um, et cetera, and these babies and, and you know, um, on, on life support or anyone on life support. So anyway, stay tuned for that. But there was also this in the New York Times on November 20th at the first quarter lunar square, quote, Bayer shares tumble to a 12-year low after drug trial is stopped. The German pharmaceutical giant announced yesterday that it would halt a trial of Oceanic, a blood thinning drug that it hoped would be a big money maker. The, that followed a legal setback last Friday on Friday when a Missouri jury ordered the company to pay $1.56 billion in damages related to its Roundup weed killer. So um, that's of interest there for also, you know, uh, that's a climate change thing, right? Roundup weed killer is, you know, killing people. Um Plus, an op-ed in the New York Times this past week was titled, The Big Me Too Moment for Doctors is Finally Here, which, of course, says there have been a spate of doctors in the news who uh, physically or sexually abused their patients. And on November 21st, also in the New York Times, I'm sorry, November 23rd, the WHO, the, the UN organization I just mentioned, asks China for details on surge of respiratory illness in children. And we know about RSV, which is, you know, uh, something that uh, seems to have sprung up since COVID. Um, but the article says, and I quote, reports of overcrowding at pediatric hospitals have raised concerns with the World Health Organization about a jump in illnesses affecting children. Gemini, remember, at this uh, lunation is young people, um, in addition to the other things mentioned. And on November 22nd, out of the New York Times, uh, there was this article titled, What to Know About the Mysterious Respiratory Illness Affecting Dogs. And it says, dogs in at least seven states have been infected. Symptoms include coughing, fever, lethargy, and intermittent loss of appetite. And in, I believe, I'm not uh, speaking out of term, in a 
small percentage, some of these dogs have passed away. So um, bear in mind that the overall message of this Gemini full moon really is to examine any of our righteous thinking. We can see it in the collective. It's extremely obvious. And to, you know, make perhaps in alignment with that, however this makes sense to any particular individual, you know, uh, making changes in our own health, right? So um, we want to release where we've righteously clung to certain beliefs that just no longer are appropriate. And if we look at the Israeli-Gaza situation in Hamas, we can see that in such stark relief. So how do we bring that down to our personal lives and say, well, what have I been convinced of that maybe I, I, I might want to open my mind to learn more about now because perhaps things have changed, right? These are mutable signs. And how can I now ask more questions, listen to the answers, and think about it? You know, nobody's saying, like, you know, you, you have to change religions or anything like that, you know, or professions or whatever. But, you know, the philosopher Sagittarius in the Sagittarius Sun is being asked how he derived at his philosophy. And if it was based on something from 25 years ago or 40 years ago um, or even before you were born 100 years ago and there have been new advances, the Gemini moon is like, dude... Like, uh, did you know that now you don't have to do it that way because they invented that you don't have to put your stuff on a horse um, or carry it in a horse-drawn cart. You can put it in the car. Oh, and since then, you can get in an airplane. And instead of driving uh, 3,300 miles across country, you can fly in like, I don't know, six hours. Wow. And then, of course, advance to the man on the moon and the rocket ship you know so where are where are we are we back with the horse and cart are we at the automobile are we at the um uh, the airplane stage or you know have we advanced to the rocket ship stage and what needs to change in any archaic any philosophies that are based on archaic sets of facts things are no longer the way they were all right, thank you everyone for joining me. I hope you found the information presented here helpful as you continue your karmic evolution in this lifetime. Please be sure to join me next week, December 1st, for another episode of Karmic Evolutions Astrologically Speaking. Until then, may your journey be filled with karmic healing and the joy of greater consciousness. Namaste. Long ago, before this day's confusion did begin. Throughout the stars did we go wandering Distance was no barrier And time it had no hope Free to come And free to go Free to come and free to go Open up the book The book of